Take your Bible to 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. I really like the word revival. I love to preach in revivals. I, I've been, you know, places where I, I really knew that the church was ready for the meeting. And I've been other places where I knew that they weren't ready at all. I know they weren't ready for me. Because <laughs> I did everything within my power to just let it rip. As a matter of fact, I, I remember going to one place one time and this guy drove a truck. And he wasn't there very often. He just happened to come maybe once or twice a month because he was over the road truck driver. And he made the comment to his dad, who was one of the elders, where did we get this guy? <laughs> he was talking about me. Now, I don't know if he meant that good or bad. He said, where did we get this guy? So I, I always try to do the very best that I can with the ability and the gift and the talent that God has given to me. I try to give my best. So uh, we're thinking about revival tonight. In, in this passage, this is God's second appearance to Solomon. You remember the first one is in 1 Kings chapter 3 where, <coughs> excuse me, God said, ask what you will and it will be granted to you. What do you want? And Solomon said, give your servant an understanding heart. In other words, I want wisdom. I want wisdom. To be able to discern right and wrong, truth from error, good and evil, I want wisdom. And it was like that blank check was given to Solomon. As you know, he wrote several books. He wrote thousands of proverbs. He wrote a journal that I consider to be the most current relative journal book of the whole Old Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes. And the saddest part about this man's life was that he allowed other people to turn him away from God to other gods, little g, plural, G-O-D-S, and that was sad. But as his second appearance to Solomon came, watch what's said here in verse 12. The Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. This is Solomon dedicating the temple back in 1 Chronicles chapter 7. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, nor command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. Now watch God's recipe for revival. It's here in verse 14. It is a powerful verse. As a matter of fact, this would change the course of the United States of America if we could get folk to follow what's in this one verse. Here it is. If my people, he writes to the Jews, the Israelites, the Hebrews at that time, if my people, watch this, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. That was it. God's second appearance to Solomon. And he's telling these Hebrews, Jews, Israelites, you need to turn from your idols. If my people, well, let's, let's fast forward into the 21st century. Who are God's people today? Well, it's not just the Jewish nation. <laughs> that was God's people under the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the Old Law. But God's people today are those who've been redeemed, justified, bought back by the blood of Jesus. They are Christians. They're 99.9% .9 of the people that are in this room tonight are the people of God. We are God's people. Now, as we look at that in the New Testament, it's in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. If you're wondering where we're going with this, 1 Peter 2, verse 9. And so let's just go over there and look at that verse. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Here is a several designations, if you will, of the people of God in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Notice what he says. You are a chosen generation, that's a chosen race or a chosen family, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. These are the people of God today. The people of God that are this chosen generation, those who chose 
God and Jesus in baptism and in immersion. We are a royal priesthood. I know that you see the pomp and circumstance of 850 or 900 million Roman Catholics who go through this high church and there is a guy who comes out in flowing robes and he wears a collar around backwards and he's referred to as a priest. Did you know according to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, every Christian is a priest. You see, here, here's, here's the concept of Roman Catholicism for Catholics. The priest is the one who intercedes for you to God. But we don't need that because we're all priests. And everybody in this room has access to God individually. You and I each do. By virtue of the fact that we are Christians, we can pray to God and talk to God on an individual basis. So we are a royal priesthood of believers. And we are a holy nation. We are people that set apart. We are not like the world is. We're not like that. So we're set apart and we are holy. And the last mention that he gives there is that we are a special people. I think the old King James Version, if my memory serves me correctly, says a peculiar people. You know, in this day and time, there is nobody that really wants to be thought of as peculiar. But, but the, what that word really means is what the new King James Version says, a special people. And we are special, and we have to understand that. So going back to 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people... And so then it was the Jews, Hebrews, Israelites. Tonight it's New Testament Christians. If my people shall humble themselves. How hard is that for us to know that God is above us? That God is above us and that we are below him? And sometimes because of the positions that we hold and you know, we're, we're a vice president, or we're a CEO, or we're a COO, or we're head of this line, or we're a, a director, or we're a, a whatever, you know. We, we've, we've got this position. Sometimes in our positions, it's hard to think about us humbling ourselves. But that's what he says. If my people will humble themselves, humility. James talked about it so frequently in James chapter 4. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And Jesus even told a parable on it, Luke 18, 9 through 14, about those two men that went up to pray. One was one way and one was the other way. And the one's prayer that was accepted was the one who showed humility, who recognized his own inadequacies and weaknesses and faults and failures and shortcomings. We do have to humble ourselves. And that simply, to me, says this. If I'm going to humble myself, I'm going to recognize that I need God. Let, let me give you a little secret tonight. and A lot of you may already know this. But I want to tell you why it's so hard to reach Americans with the gospel. You want to know why? Because they're doing pretty good without, in their view, they're doing pretty good without God. they got a pretty good job. They drive a pretty nice vehicle. They live in a pretty nice place. They wear pretty nice clothes. They go to pretty nice places to eat. They, go to, they have their recreational places that they go and have a lot of fun with. And, and people like that sometimes, you know what they say? I've got all this. Why do I need God? Where if you go to the Bahamas tonight, no, you can't get there. <laughs> but if you were to, do you think any of that matters to any of those people tonight? None of that matters. Their, their livelihood was what matters, and their dependence on God is at a zenith and an apex. You remember what ours was like in 9-11? We're fixing to come up on 9-11. What is today? Today's the uh, ninth, right? 9-11's in two days. There are going to be a lot of stories, a lot of remembrances. Where were you? 9-11. Sellers Crane always tells the story, and I should start telling it. He always tells the story that he was with me. I need to start telling the story I was with him. We were together. He was in Frankfurt for a gospel meeting, and we had him down, and I'm telling you what, it absolutely destroyed that meeting. 
I mean, it really did. We, we should have really stopped that night and, and, and closed out the meeting and just moved forward because everybody's thoughts, even though they should have been on other things, everybody was kind of segregated into their own homes. And people weren't out gallivanting around very much. Airfare had stopped. Buses had quit running. Everything just kind of came to a stand. So you remember it. Humility is dependence on God. So if my people shall humble themselves and seek me, turn to me, recognize me. This is a recipe for revival for the United States of America because of the direction that our country is going and the direction that our world is in. And you know that even as I speak. He said, if they will turn from their evil ways. You know, I don't have to remind anybody in this room. When we exit this room, we're facing a world of darkness and a world of tremendous evil. I mean evil. And, 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 and let me say this, not to be cynical at all, because I don't think I am, but you are not completely, totally safe anywhere anymore. You're not. I've had people tell me, man, we need to avoid crowds. That seems like they always go to a crowd. What about the guy who just out of his window of his vehicle just starts shooting people? Doesn't matter where he is, he's just going down the road and he wipes out about 10 or 12 people. You're not safe anywhere anymore, completely and totally, even in this great, grand old United States of America. So what's the antidote? People have to turn from their evil ways. And you know what that word is? It's repent. America, America needs to repent. There's no doubt about it. And if we're going to have a recipe for a revival in our land, it's going to have to come from the inner recesses of our heart where we say we are going to turn from our evil ways and we're going to repent. And in doing so, God told Solomon in verse 14, then will I heal their land. The second scripture I want to spend a little time on tonight is Romans 1.16, if you'll turn over there. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. I want to talk about this a little bit in connection with our Friday, Saturday, Sunday meeting. And I, I don't know if you had a chance to pick up the flyer with the uh, five sermon topics on it or not, and I hope that you have. And we do have a few more of these out there in the foyer, and I want you to pick the rest of these up. As a matter of fact, we've got some more of those cards be sure to take a picture of that on your phone and send it, and, and, and let's get rid of those cards tonight and you know, distribute those in the next couple of days. If, if you looked at this, Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also now to the Gentile. I want you to think about that word, ashamed. And, and Brian, you might correct me if I'm wrong on this, but uh, wasn't one of the CYCs unashamed? What's it this year? Last year. Last year. This last year. Unashamed. And, and what a challenge that is to live unashamed before pagan people. I mean, really. Our young people, when they go to the secular school, they have to live unashamed in front of that mass of humanity that has no regard for God or good. One of the reasons why that I predicted this, and uh, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but at Foundation, where Chris Robinson and Melissa Young are, that school is growing, and they're having growing pains. And, and, and the reason, one of the reasons why is, because of these parents who say, I'm not sure I want to send my kid into an abyss, so to speak. Sometimes you can't help it and avoid it. And so they gravitate towards something that is a little more wholesome. Now, I realize we've got some good teachers, and I'm thankful that we do, still in the public school system. And I'm thankful for them, grateful for them. But to live unashamed, even, even as a young couple today, when so many young couples are into so many other things instead of being into God, it's tough to live unashamed. 
And like we talked about this morning in our, in our collection, in our offering, in our contribution, that, that we have to have these young couples coming up to help finance the work of the church because some of the rest of us are getting a little bit older and are moving out of the scene and out of the picture. And so you've got to have those people coming on who understand the concept of the offering to finance the work of the church. And, and incidentally, if you're... If you're teenager has a job you, you need to already begin telling them whatever you make a portion of that should go into the contribution a portion of that should this is what we taught our daughters when they were in high school our oldest daughter she worked at Baskin Robbins for about three years I wish she would have stayed there she could own the franchise now and I could have as much ice cream as I want <laughs> but she didn't she moved on to IT software you know big time IT software and Jenny Lynn, all she does is just put people in jail, you know. Uh, have a, anyway, but, but, you know, I don't even know where I was going with that thought. Uh, but, but, you know, be, be, to be unashamed among, among pagans, you know, it's tough. And, and we have to start young. I think it was, uh, let me think who this was. It was telling me this morning. It's, it's coming to me. Paula at the door. When you're telling me about children, some children in India, that, that they started into their mind, their six-year-old, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a doctor. And when they got, you know, 28, 30 years old, you know what they were? They were a doctor because they started at six years old. We have to start early training our children and young people to be unashamed. Look at Acts 4.13. Acts 4.13. I want to tell you something. Don't ever tell me something at the door because I might repeat it, okay? <laughs> Just be careful what you, what you tell me going out the door because I, I remember all of those things, especially the ones about the great sermons. Okay, Acts 4.13. So when they saw the boldness, the courage that they were unashamed, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Even though they were untrained and unlearned and somewhat uncouth in a lot of ways, people still looked at them and they said, you're different, you're special, you've been with Jesus, haven't you? I know you have. Because you have boldness and we marvel at your boldness. What, what that is is just being unashamed. It's being unashamed. So what we have in front of us on Friday, Saturday, Sunday is the difference between good news and bad news. Now, everybody in this room, you know the bad news. I mean, it comes, no, no pun intended when I say this, but it comes in waves. And this, this hurricane has been terrible, terrible news for, for several days, a couple of weeks. And it has caused a lot of consternation and, and damage that some will never recover from. Drive-by shootings, mass shootings. We're gonna, you know, there was a threat in, in the public school system of Kentucky that some Kentucky school is going to be lit up. And, and, and the FBI and the CIA and your local authorities, they're constantly checking out these threats over and over and over again to, to keep our children and teachers and administration safe, you know, in our, in our schools. But that, that's bad news. And, 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 you know, hearing that you have, fill in the blank, uh, uh, some type of physical difficulty going on in your life or, or you, you've invested in something and it's gone south on you and you're really hurting financially or, I mean, the bad news just comes at us and comes at us and comes at us and, and what we have in the gospel is good news and we desperately need it and, and I don't know of a subject like I said this morning that is more needed in our day and time than forgiveness there are people that if you open these doors and as loud as I am there are people within the sound of my voice who are struggling with the need to be forgiven can you imagine five specific lessons on forgiveness number one forgiveness is a gift from God I look forward to hearing that Friday night. Saturday night, I really look forward to hearing this. Forgiveness, a gift I give myself. And there are a lot of people, I talk to them frequently, on the phone, email, text, who have not and will not forgive themselves. Class Sunday morning, forgiveness, a gift I give others. 
And then as it relates to our relationship with God, worship next Sunday morning, permission to enjoy remission of sins. And then this last lesson that I can't really wait to hear, forgiveness, a gift that I give to God. I cannot tell you how much I'm looking forward to hearing the good news from this platform and the opportunities we get to get and give good news from this platform every single week. It is a privilege of mine to do that. Let, let me tell you very quickly in closing what's encompassed in good news. Number one, hope. Do you have it tonight? Hope. A confident expectation there's something better out there. And out there means from God, spiritually. Not that the world is ever going to give me, I, the world's not going to give me any hope. But God and Jesus are going to give me hope. Number two, encompassed within the confines of the gospel, I would say, is peace. P-E-A-C-E. -E. Peace. We, we, we read that verse and it's so special. And the peace of God will guard and keep your hearts and minds. Are you at peace tonight with God, with your spouse, with your children, with your parents, with your elders, with your preacher, with, with, with your members? Are you at peace in your relationships? And I guess the third thing we could talk about encompassed in the good news is joy. Joy is something that really is down deep. And I, I love the song, and I don't, you know, I'm, I'm hardly ever in here anymore during vacation Bible school, but uh, because I'm always out there, I've got the joy, 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 where? Down in my heart, that's where it is. And so that good news encompasses really those three things, hope, peace, joy, and I could include a fourth one, love. 